Lord Soccer Park, I can say, is a home. Is a good place. Like the way it is right now, is good. It's so beautiful to live here. For me, it is, because I've been here over 20, 27 years, and I've seen the changes. There are so many programs at the schools. There's kids all here playing. People are out doing their yard work, barbecuing. We know all each other. 12 years ago, it wasn't like that. Now it's like, it's so beautiful. If we can create not a solution to poverty, but improve the circumstances of people in a poor community to the extent that we have done in Lord Selkirk Park. It can be done anywhere. All across North America in the 50s and the 60s, big public housing complexes like Lord Selkirk Park were built. And they all followed very much the same pattern. They started off with people really loving them for the first few years, and then they began to deteriorate. Uh, they deteriorated to the point that in the late 80s and into the 90s, the government started bulldozing public housing projects. And when we came in here in 2005, some people were saying, this place is a mess, we ought to bulldoze it. You didn't really want to be outside. You didn't want to get to know your neighbor. You know what I mean? You didn't want to walk around. And I'm going to honestly say 12 years ago, it was in a very nice park. It was very, very hard to live here. There was so much gangs. You couldn't go outside, you know, without fearing what's going to happen to you. Oh, back here there was windows busted, graffiti all over the place, beer bottles everywhere. There was gangs roaming around beating up people. It's indescribable what this park, that we call it, looked like. Uh, the houses looked terrible, um, they were boarded up. I've seen third world countries that live, lived better than they did here in the 90s. And it wasn't an existence for a baby to live in, that's for sure. They referred to Lord Selkirk Park as the place of last resort to live, um, a war zone, kind of like not wanting to be here, right? It was kind of the um, last place they, they wanted to be, but that's where they got placed. Rather than bulldoze a place that admittedly had a lot of problems, we saw the strengths in the community. So this is the importance of an asset building approach to community development. You identify the assets in a community, the strengths in a community. There's a lot of good people here. And there's, a, there's been so much change here that we want to see the park stay the way it is. You understand the niceness, the beautifulness, the calmness of it. As you can tell, kids are all over the place. I love the sound of kids just, you know, screaming, laughing. The, the, the community spirit here is just absolutely phenomenal. In 2005, the North End Community Renewal Corporation got what's called a Comprehensive Community Initiative, which was a, a, a federal program that provided funding for safety initiatives. But what they wanted to do was to promote safety by promoting social and economic development here. Uh, we came out with a community plan, and people were able to say these are some of the priorities that we'd like, like to see. The way we worked in here was I think a good example of community development. We started the resource center in a couple of units. At that time, uh, two Aboriginal staff uh, worked there, and one was a coordinator and the other was a resource center coordinator. Part of my job was really to reach out and to do a lot of outreach and to go talk, to uh, give people updates of what's going on. They had community barbecues, which brought out a lot of people from the community to get to know their neighbors and sort of uh, socialize and, and network. We quickly became known as, you know, like, okay, if you have an idea, if you want to see something happen, go to the resource center and let them know. People gradually started to come, develop relationships, and I think that was the beginning of the strong sense of community that we, that we now see in here.
every step along the way was celebrated to show that, you know, working together really can make things happen. And then in the big financial crisis of 2007-8, all provinces got dollars to invest in the community to stimulate the economy. And what the provincial government of the day did was to invest that in the renovation of all of these buildings. People who had lived here for many, many years had lived here with no renovations since the project was built. And all of a sudden we were gonna be able to do these really wonderful things for them and renovate and update and build a community really. They had a big meeting and they invited anybody from the community who was interested that wasn't working at the time that if they came in, um, they would train us even without like any um, experience. So I did, I went and uh, they hired me, of course, they took it and uh, they did, they trained us and I ended up staying with them and ended up uh, developing a career out of it that I'm now chasing because I've gone back to school now. I want to get uh, my construction management papers. We really wanted to make sure that we didn't have outside people coming in. It was all from building from within and, and uh, supporting and honoring, you know, what they, what they had to offer. It was all actually a lot of the people that worked in the developments were from the developments. It was a good learning experience for everybody. I was an assistant supervisor. I trained here. I trained um, other people to help redevelop the, the area. Everything was put in that is brand new. They're just absolutely gorgeous. They're beautiful compared to uh, what they were 12 years ago. Absolutely, the money was very well spent. It's very, very much not a case of people coming in from the outside and saying, I've read a book and so I know you should do X, Y, or Z. Instead, it's, it's building trust, building relationships, listening and doing the things that the people in the community, who are the real experts about their community, doing the things that they want to do. People in the townhouses had all moved into what was now their new home that had all been redone and then we had vacancies. Someone said something to me about the immigrant population and I'm going, hmm, okay. So we connected with them and came over and they did a, we did a couple of tours and showed them what we'd done. And all of a sudden this was the place to be. Immigrant uh, population is quite large here now. So, so that was a huge change because we were basically a very large Aboriginal population in this particular project. You find my door is, um I'm a refugee, like I'm, a, I'm from Uganda. The next door is Aboriginal. The other door is someone from Rwanda. The other door, like, and the children play together. They don't see that different. I like it. I love it. I wish everybody get the same opportunity I'm getting and my children. I hug them and they know they hug me and then we talk how their country was and how mine is, like I'm an Aboriginal. And we all share, we don't, we don't judge each other. We, we don't do that. Nobody cares about color. Nobody cares about your family, your background, where you come from. Everybody's just the same. It's safer for the kids. My kids come and play here sometimes. They're, they're always safe and they always have fun. Nobody bothers them more. It's, it's nice. I like it around here. We were talking with people in the community constantly. And what became apparent is that people wanted childcare. So we worked with the government of the day to get the childcare center built. This um, center opened up in 2012. Manadu Giminigonan is our name. We were named in, when we opened up in Arby Russell, um, and it means the great spirit is giving. Healthy Child Manitoba, uh, they were working on uh, a project that they wanted to bring into Canada called the Abisterian Project, and sort of things just aligned up. We were sort of merged together. Uh, it's all about starting from the beginning, building a relationship with the child, respecting what the child wants, one-on-one um, -on -one interaction between adult and child. The, this day is just like second home to my children. My children feel so safe and I feel my children are safe and when they're here.
many of the single mums in particular were just completely fed up with being on welfare, on social assistance. They felt isolated. They felt their lives were going nowhere at all. And they wanted to get their grade 12. What we decided to do was to bring an adult learning center into the communities. Then we found that some of the people who wanted to get their grade 12 weren't ready for high school classes, so we created the literacy program. So the literacy program runs out of one of the units, and it's packed. Most of the students are, I would say, from 21 to 55. At one point, I think 100% of the students were First Nations Aboriginal students. Um, but the last three years, I've seen an increased need in ESL learning. When I came here, I didn't speak English, but now I'm trying my best. Because of my future, I need to finish grade 12, and I take a course to change your life. Education is, is the key for the students, for the learners, for members of the community to, to have a chance uh, to, to better themselves and, and to be positive role models to their children. My spelling, so the teachers say, is coming along a lot better than when it was when I started. And I can see the improvements too, so it makes me feel proud of myself. Especially when we do a spelling test and you get it right, and it's like, oh, right on, I did it, you know. And hopefully I will graduate and get my grade 12 and go into a social working program. 25% of our learners move every year and they either move on to an adult learning program, which is CACIAL, or whatever program they want to go to, to uh, obtain a mature grade 12 diploma. So that, that's what our success is. The success is the learners moving and, and the learners do move. The adult learning centers offer the mature grade 12. They're geared for adults. It's a different way of doing uh, high school. It works extremely well. So we brought uh, an adult learning center into Turtle Island, the community center in the middle of Lord Selkirk Park, and it was named Kakia. Kakia Le Monde Le Cool, All People's School. Coming here to this school has made me realize my dreams and it's putting my dreams to, to reality. So I've always wanted to graduate. I've always wanted to go back to, go to Red River College and graduate from, to, be, to become a nurse. So I'm on the path of doing that and I'm determined to get it done. I needed an education and I need my diploma. I'm, I'm the first out of six kids to get my diploma, the first. And my siblings, my sisters and brothers are thinking of going back too. Education helps them prepare them for other things that they want to do. Maybe they want to find a job, a different job, or they, they might look at another career where what they've been doing has disappeared. So education allows them to see what else is out there. I was a journeyman in my trade. I'm a steel framer, drywaller. My doctor uh, retired me in June 9th, 2014, due to rotating cuffs. So I had to uh, evaluate my goals and I thought, well, why not go back to school? I'm in Kakiao now. I'm graduating this June. Now I'm going into a applied accounting at Red River. So we're both pretty well in the same, same trade, <laughs> going into the same trade accounting. Oh, too bad, you gotta wear it. <laughs> I got crippled up with my arthritis and I couldn't go back to work. I was welding for the last 15 years and I knew I couldn't stand in eight hours a day at a, at a job anymore. So I, I did, decided that I want to do something with my life. Still, I want to do something. So I went back to school in uh, five years ago. I went to Kakiel, graduated. Kakiel is a wonderful school. It's a small class, and that was really very, very uh, good for me. Hopefully, maybe 
her and I are thinking about maybe getting into our own uh, business. Our own business. Business uh, in accounting, going as a partnership maybe, yeah. maybe a couple years down the road. Pacquiao is the best thing that happened to Turtle Island and to the community here because you see them going to school and they need that. And the people that teach them, they're very understanding because some of them don't have that high, high grade and they work with them, you know, gradually so they can build themselves up and, you know, have that feeling that they can do it. I felt so, so proud that I, that I graduated. It was just a wonderful feeling when I went up there and watching all the other graduates. And uh, now I want to go and uh, watch my sister come out from there and see your graduate. When you work with people and help them develop leadership skills, they develop their confidence and, you know, they get some good successes and, uh, and then it just kind of springboards from there as to what they might want to do. There's a virtuous kind of cycle that can happen where things start to improve and uh, with those improvements, there's a celebration of the improvements and an attitudinal change happens. People develop a sense of hope that they can build a better future. And if you believe that you can build a better future for yourself and your family and your community, uh, then you can, with proper supports, uh, you can do that. I never thought at my age I would be going back to school. But it goes to show you're never too old if you want it bad enough. For the younger generation, keep going to school. If I can do it, you can do it. A big part of this was having in place a government that was prepared to invest in the community. Most governments don't want to invest in low-income communities. They've written off low-income communities. And instead of investing to make social change, they'll hire more police to control the problems in the neighborhood. So we've made the neighborhood here a safer place, not by bringing in more police, but by creating more opportunities for people. And once people start to take advantage of those opportunities, feel better about themselves, it really picks up a head of steam and a sense of its own momentum. I've, I've ended up rebuilding myself in this community and I've also ended up with a, with a new career out of this community. So uh, I really like this community. The result is a neighborhood now that has a strong sense of, uh, of community uh, and that people want to move into. I mean, now, today, people actually want to move into Lord Southwark Park. We care about each other now. At one time, we couldn't because we didn't know. And we didn't know anything like that. When I first came here, it was so violent. You couldn't trust anyone. But today, you get to know a person because of these programs and you know what, uh, you know, you know their children. And as a community, you help each other.